So let's talk about IndexedDB. You need a database sometimes for your application, something to store some dynamic data. <coughs> and IndexedDB is what we get now with progressive web apps. There is an older database called WebSQL. Um, but for some long reasons that if you really want to know, come ask me over lunch, um, was deprecated in favor of IndexedDB. So sometimes you need just a database to store some data. And here's a quick example. This is from one of the Google samples of the four beetles. So name, nickname, age, and whether or not they're alive. And it's a table, and I could sort it based on the different attributes, you know, the different columns on the table. But IndexedDB is not what you might expect from a database. So how many of you are, have used a SQL database? OK, how many have used, have used a NoSQL database? OK, this is a NoSQL database. So it's not relational. Uh, it's not really even tables. It's a set of object stores, which an object store is just a collection of JavaScript objects. They don't all have to be in the same format, although it's an awfully good idea to keep them pretty similar to each other just for searching and sorting. <coughs> and you can stick any JavaScript object, files, blobs, whatever you need to stick in there. So we talked about yesterday, one idea was if you're doing video, you could actually download the individual chunks of video and stick them in the database, and then use a media source extension to read the database and stream that into your destination. You can write data <laughs> by itself to the database. Um, <coughs> without using the object store, but normally you should contain them in object stores. So the example that we showed at the start, the musicians. Um, so each object does get an internal ID number. You don't normally have access to it, although you can ask the database th using a special key to get at it. Normally, though, this is hidden from you. Um, then you can declare one of the columns a key and give it a key path. So that means that I could search and sort on this one. I can have multiple keys, but normally it's one key per. So I do, actually, sorry, it's, you can have multiple indexes, but it's one key per, data, per object store. So my key is the name, and then I insert the value, and the values are just standard JavaScript objects. OK. So index DB by itself is kind of a pain to program. Um, <coughs> When it was built, it was built. We didn't have promises yet. Um, so it was actually built using events and callbacks, because they're all asynchronous operations. And writing IndexedDB code with all of those can be really challenging. You write a lot of event handlers. You write a lot of callbacks. So this is the one time where we completely recommend using a library instead, and it's called IndexedDB Promised. Jake Archibald, who worked on the service worker spec, wrote this little wrapper library. So it wraps IndexedDB and promises and just makes it drastically simpler to use. There's one place where you won't use promises, and it's at the very start, but let me show that to you. <coughs> so we're going to open the database first. Give it a name and a version number, and that version number should increment any time you change the schema. That, so that should be tied to a schema. And then you need to pass in a function call um, that's the upgrade callback. So let's do a data store. OK, so we're going to call IDB open. We'll call this test database version 1. Give it the upgrade database function, which is the callback. So the database contains multiple object stores. This function, when you open the database, its job is to look at the structure of the database and make any changes needed to make it current. So that might mean creating new object stores. Now, you could call create object store directly. But if an object store already exists, you'll get an exception. The whole thing is going to fail. Um, you know, it's no fun. So instead, we do a quick check, make sure that object store names uh, does not contain that object store. So make sure we don't have it already. And if we don't, go ahead and create it. So you can create object store. If you need a primary key, you can create it with a key path. If you can also um, create an object store and tell it to auto increment, which gives you an automatic serial number, but you don't have direct access to that. Or you can give it a key path and an auto increment. Now you have a property added to every object that's an incrementing unique number. <coughs> 
Then to add indexes, because you want to be able to search and sort on this on probably more than just the key, come on. Um, you call create index, you tell it the name of the index, the name of the field you want to index, so they don't have to be identical. Um, and in this case, is that a unique value or not? So unique will be used if you do, for example, a replace, if it's a unique value, we'll look at the email index and replace. If I do a put with that email, it'll replace it. If that wasn't unique, I would do a put and it would add a second entry of that email. So working with data, all the usual operations, right? Add, get, put, delete, get all, which grabs a array. And cursor, when you have a bunch of data, you can set a cursor and just start walking through. Come on. Now, index DB does have one really nice thing about it, which is it's transaction based. So a transaction is a wrapper around a group of operations. They either all execute together or the database is rolled back. And they don't, either they all execute together or they don't execute at all. It's non-optional, unfortunately. So what you have to do to do an operation in here is get the database object. So open the database, ask for a transaction, open the object store on the transaction. It's a little repet It's going to get a little repetitive here. Um, if you need an index, open that, and then do your operations. The advantage of all of this work, though, is uh, consistency in the database. It's very hard to leave the database in an inconsistent state. <coughs> so open the database, open the transaction, tell the transaction which object stores it's going to operate on. So that way it can do appropriate locking across all of them. Because remember, it's a non-relational database. You don't have automatic connections between tables or stores. So you have to do that yourself. And so you have to tell it all the stores that you're going to use. Open the object store you need. Do an action like store.add, which will take some time. And now return transaction.complete. In the, the uh, IDB promised, this returns a promise that resolves when the transaction's done. If you are writing native IndexedDB code, you'd actually be listening for an event at this point. Actually, you'd be listening for two, uh, success or fail. Now, to read the data, open the transaction, tell it which object store, open the object store, and call get. Notice that I'm not waiting for the transaction to complete here. I'm doing a single read operation. It's either going to succeed or fail. It, it, happens, it triggers when the transaction does. So basically, as soon as that returns, you know the transaction's closed. There's no need to wait on the transaction. Now, if I had done store.get, made a decision, done another put, you know, done some things that wrote back to the database, then I'd want to wait for the transaction to complete. For a single get like this, you don't really need to wait. <coughs> now, when I look at this code, right, here's an update, right? Get something, get the transaction, put it in, great. Same pattern, you're getting the picture. People who've written database code before, what seems to be missing here? I'm creating the transaction, but what am I not doing? I'm not committing it. Right? Because index DB doesn't have a commit call for the transaction. Essentially, um, <coughs> the, the mental model you should have, it's not exactly perfect, but it's close enough. It's what the spec says, is that the transaction will be done by the end of the next idle loop in the browser. The idle loop is when the browser is not doing work and it normally starts processing events. So it'll process transactions just like it's processing events. Now, depending on the browser, it may actually happen sooner than that. <coughs> so in this case, we might get to the end of this block. And in Chrome, Chrome schedules things not just with the event loop, but what are called microtasks. And so in Chrome, when the microtasks are done, then it'll go ahead and start executing the, trans the transactions. But that's even before you get to the idle loop. So what the spec promises is by the time you get through the idle loop, your transactions will have committed. OK, so if the browser crashes the way this is written, I mean, if it crashed right in the middle of the commit, if you get that unlucky, maybe you've got inconsistency in the database. 
but normally what's going to happen is, is that that commit is atomic and it's designed to happen all at once. Everything gets staged on the side, typically in a database. Now, I don't know the exact implementation here, but commits are designed to be atomic and they're designed to be you know, pretty resilient to failures like that. So there's no separate way to check for inconsistencies that I know of. Um, but obviously, you want to have your own way of looking at your database. Just make sure everything is, is consistent. But those kinds of sudden crashes right in the middle of the database code are going to be very unlikely. Oh, like, do I have any sync ability between, say, two databases? Not natively, no. You'd have to add that yourself. So for deleting data, it looks like everything else. Just call delete. Wait for the transaction to be done. To get everything, call get all. Again, not waiting for the transaction, because once we've got the data, we're good. Cursors are a little tricky. So this is the one place where it's harder to do this with a promise. By the way, all of these, you know, you can use then and catch because it's a standard promise. We handle the errors. Whoops, back up. Um, so cursors are a little tricky. <coughs> Get the store, call open cursor, so now we have a pointer to somewhere in the database. Write a function in line. At this time, don't make it anonymous. OK, let's see if this doesn't advance my screen. Give it a name. Ah, all right. I need a long stick. Um, so I'm going to name that function. Normally, that's an anonymous function. Here, I need to name it because I need to be able to call it. Sh I'll call it show items. It takes the cursor. If the cursor is null, you're done. Bail out. And otherwise, the data will be in cursor.value. We can go ahead and log all those fields. And then call cursor.continue to advance it to the next item. Once it hits the end, it'll be null. And then call show items with the next cursor value. So it's a little strange, but it does work. That's the one place where doing promises makes this a little bit trickier. Now, for ranges, I can specify a range. So if I don't want the whole database, I can specify a lower bound on an index. I can specify an upper bound or a range in between. <coughs> so in this case, I'm going to set a range. I call store get all from that range, so everything from soda on up. Pretty straightforward. There are polyfills and libraries. We really like IndexedDB Promised. IndexedDB Shim is interesting. Local forage is really popular around Google, at least in developer relations, because um, it lets you work with IndexedDB if it's there. And if it's not, it has several fallbacks for local storage, including local web storage. So it's a nice abstraction on the top of things. But for this lab, and for the purposes of this class, we're using IndexedDB with IndexedDB Promised. And of course, as you're used to, we've got a lab. So IndexedDB lab, you'll experiment basically with the whole thing. Create the object stores and indexes, do database operations, create, retrieve, update, delete, grab all the data, push things into the database, and then write any experiments that you want to write. Typical timing, it's about half an hour. Um, go ahead and start.